right, all right. Good morning, you guys. How are we doing today? I'm sorry. That that was really, really weak. Um, uh, This is a good time to remind you there is coffee in the back, okay? Uh, Some of you guys may need some this morning. Okay, it's why it's there. We're going to try this again. How are you guys doing this morning? Good? And if you're not doing good, it's okay. Just say, ah, right? There you go. We got a couple of ass. That's okay. Um, so we are uh, continuing in our series in Exodus. Um, we have been kind of walking through this since the fall. And uh, today we get to one of the pinnacle moments in the story, right? So if you guys remember, we, we reached one of those at the crossing of the Red Sea. That was kind of a pinnacle moment, right? A, a kind of Sunday school story moment, right? That, that probably we're all very familiar with as God parts the Red Sea for the Israelites to walk across um, on dry ground. And so today we come to uh, a second pinnacle moment, and that is giving of the God's law or God's words at Mount Sinai, right? Um, What has become known as the Ten Commandments. And for most of us, we're very familiar um, with these Ten Commandments. In fact, um, if if we were to go out today just into the community and just to ask people what it means to be a Christian, there's a really high probability that a lot of people would give some of these Ten Commandments um, as what it means to be a Christian or a follower of God. So these are very, very familiar to us. But as often the case, sometimes uh, familiarity with something kind of breeds con- content with contempt with it, right? Or, or this idea that we just like, we get so familiar with it that we just kind of check out and feel like, oh, well, we know everything that there is to know about this. And so we don't have to think about it too much, right? My hope this morning is as we come and can take a fresh look at these 10 commands, these 10 laws, these 10 words that God delivers to the Israelites, right? Then maybe we can see that in a, in a different light than maybe we are familiar or used to. My hope is that we can see the heart behind why God gave this to the Israelites, And so to help us with that, um, I just want to remind us of kind of where we went last week. Last week, Ross um, taught through the Israelites coming to Sinai, right? Um, They they get to the mountain after kind of wandering around in in some of the wastelands uh, for a while. They finally make it to the mountain of God, to Mount Sinai. And, And Ross drew this connection last week between them arriving at Sinai and a marriage ceremony, right? The picture uh, of God uh, entering into a covenant relationship with his people. And as he did that, we saw these different movements in that, from courting to wooing to inviting to affirming this covenant relationship. And so as we continue in our passage today, what I want us to think about these 10 commandments or these 10 words, right? I want us to think about them in the light of the vows that each side is, is making, right? And what's really cool is that we get to see both of those in our passage today. So as we begin, I want to ask a question just to kind of get us all into that. When you guys hear the phrase Ten Commandments, right, or we get to this passage in Exodus 20, what are some things that come to mind when you think about that? Yes, ma'am. Rules. I like it. I think a lot of us think about rules. Okay, what else? What else do we think about? <laughs> Nobody. It's just rules. We all just think about rules. Uh, what about like marriage? Marriage. marriage. Yes. Yes. And this is where I hope we end up today, is, is kind of seeing this as not strictly rules, um, but, but in the covenantal agreement between marriage. Does anybody think of the old Charleston Heston movie, right? The Ten Commandments, right? Going up on the mountain. So you guys are like, who's Charleston Heston? That's okay. That's for, what? Chores. Ch- chores. That's my child right there. That's my child. We'll, we'll put that on there. Um, chores. Okay. I promise I don't have a Ten Commandment of chores in my house. Uh, Chris? I mean, I think it sounds bad, but I think like raising them, like how we should have to teach them. Okay. Yeah. Like it's almost like this, uh, 
impossible task, right? That we uh, try and try and try, but, but we just can't find a way to keep these things, okay? That's a, good, that's a good start to our conversation. We'll pick this back up here in a little bit, um, but I want us to dive into the text, right? And I want us to see today, we're going to be looking at the first four of these, and in the first four, we're going to see that they all relate to our relationship with God. They're all vows that relate to our relationship with God. Next week, we'll look at the last six of those as they relate to our relationship with one another, okay? But let's begin by looking at Genesis chapter 20, beginning in uh, verse 1 and 2. And I think a lot of times we skip over, uh, we skip over verses 1 and 2, and these may be some of the most important contextual verses to understanding what exactly is going on with uh, with the, the people and God giving his word to them at Sinai, okay? And so let's begin. It says this, And God spoke all of these words, saying, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. Let's just pause right there. Let me, let me just pray for our time, and then I'm going to jump right into this, into this moment. Father, we, we thank you that we have your words. God, your words that are truth, that are at one side, they are commands that are for our benefit and for uh, our flourishing as a people, but at the same time, God, that are loving vows that uh, are meant to be a covenantal relationship with you, our creator. So pray this morning as we look at these 10 commands, these 10 words that you give. I pray that they would be, um, God, words that, that really, at the end of the day, reveal your heart to us. So we thank you for our time together, God. Help us to be faithful to the keeping of your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as I said, the verses 1 and 2 provide some pivotal context for us understanding what exactly this covenant is that, that, that the people are about to enter into with God, right? So first of all, it's, it's, we need to note that it is God speaking, right? Starts out, and God spoke all these words, right? And so this is God giving these vows and these actions right? And even though Moses will ultimately be the one that delivers them to the people, because the people, if you guys remember last week, are too afraid to go up to the mountain, right? And so Moses will actually be delivering, but it's important that we first realize that these are the words of God. And the first thing that God says as he relates to his people is that he reminds them of who he is. You see, this is God giving his vows in this marriage ceremony, He's reminding the people not only of what he will do, but here's the amazing thing. God reminds them of what he's already done for them, right? Most of the time when we go to a marriage ceremony, right, the, the bride and groom are standing up front and they're making promises of what they will do. God's vow is like, this is what I've already done. I think it's amazing when we think about that. Listen to what he says. I am the Lord. There, if, if in most translations, the word Lord there is in all caps, which draws us back to that moment, that personal name with, of God. And so God is reminding us people, I'm not some distant God who's just out there that just kind of started everything and then just kind of left it to its own, but I am the personal, intimate God who wants to know you and wants to enter into relationship with you. Yahweh is his name. The Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery, right? God is reminding them of what he has already done for his people. This text is going to explain how both parties now are related to one another. I love uh, Tony Morita's kind of uh, thoughts on, this, on these, these first two verses. He says, this is the gospel itself. God frees us by his grace, giving us new life, and then calls us to obedience to his words. 
Commentators ha- that have uh, studied this passage in these, in these uh, first two verses uh, often come to the place of, of, of identifying this relationship between God and humanity as in what's called in the Old Testament terms as a hesed relationship. That word hesed uh, means that one party has done something for the other, and now the other party is indebted because of what the one party has done, right? And so right off the bat, God is reminding his people what he has done for them. Before he ever tells them what they need to do, he begins by letting them know what he has done for them. And I think that's important. It's important for us to understand before we come to God, right? Right? The Bible says we were dead in our trespasses and sin, but it was God who made the first move. And God's illustrating this even in his vow of reminding the people of what he did for them. The great reformer Martin Luther said this. He said, to understand the value of the teaching of the Ten Commandments, he said, I have not progressed beyond the instruction of children in the Ten Commandments. What he meant by that was saying that there is such depth to these words that God gives to his people and the purpose behind them. There's such depth to them. They said, I've not even gone past the point of what a child's understanding of these words are. And so what's going to happen from here now that God has laid out his promise to his people, his vow to his people, not in what he will do, but again in what he's already done, now he's going to lay out what they're going to promise to do on their side of this covenantal relationship that God wants to have with his people. And one thing that we will quickly understand about the ten, these ten commandments, these ten words that God gives, is that they are more of a paradigm than an exhaustive law code, right? There's only ten of them. Right? So, so, so it's not like God goes into every detail of everything that they must do, but they're, very, uh, they're, they're a model. There are principles that should be followed, for example. Um, and even as we see throughout the Torah, which is the, the first five books, um, the, 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 the Pentateuch, the first five books of the law of Moses, right? As, as God extrapolates on some of these commandments, right? We'll see that he still doesn't give every little detail, right? Because there's supposed to be general principles that we can learn from and glean from. For example, in, in the Old Testament, there are places that it will say that one should not steal his neighbor's goat, Right? But it doesn't mention whether in anything about a sheep or an ox. But yet, if we understand the principle behind, right, the laws that he gave, we understand that they would also include anything that is our neighbor's property, for example, right? So what we don't find in these Ten Commandments is an exhaustive list of everything that God wants for human flourishing. Instead, we find principles that will guide us to a place of better knowing God and ultimately leading Uh, for what is best for us, right? And so as we see this, we'll see this, these laws show up in a few different ways throughout scripture, okay? So here at Mount Sinai, we get these 10 uh, that have been called the commandments. Maybe a better understanding of that would be 10 words, because that's actually what we get in the text. If you look at verse 1, the text that, the context that we get is just that God spoke all these words, right? The word commandment is not there. In fact, even in Deuteronomy 5, when Moses retells these, right, the word commandment is not given. Now, certainly we can imply that they were commands because they were from God, right? And they were a way in which we were to follow them. But I kind of like the phrase of these 10 words, these 10 words that God gives to his people that will lead to a relationship with him and lead ultimately to our flourishing, to the best for humanity and our relationship with God. And the reason I like 10 words is, is because I think of what you guys have already mentioned. I think many of the times when we come to these 10 commandments, the first thing we think about is the word rules, right? And then right behind that is this idea that we always can't keep these. It's, it's almost impossible to keep these. And yet, when we look back at the root of that word rules, at least the word in English, rules, it comes from the Latin word, which, which uh, we get the word for, for the trellis, 
which is the, the, the thing that a vine grows on, that grapes grow on uh, in a vineyard, right? A trellis. And really, when the root of that word rules should be the idea that it's a way to follow, right? It's a way to follow God. Not just a strict list of do's and don'ts, but a way that leads to human flourishing, that leads to the ultimate purpose of our lives, right? And here's the other thing that I think we miss many times when we just think about rules. We miss the fact that this for Israel was a good thing. The people were excited that God was giving them his way of living, Right? Because up until this point, they had no written down uh, account of God's words. Uh, they just had uh, Moses, who they would bring their problems to, uh, or who would receive instruction from God. But now they would have a written codex of what God's words were for his people. And so as they enter into this, they don't see this as a negative thing, I think, as we often do in our Western context as a group of, as a list of rules, but they saw this as something that they were excited about, right? And it's kind of like this, for those that are married in the room, right? If you're married in the room, there's a good chance, hopefully, that you want to know what your spouse likes and what they don't like, right? If you want to be a great partner in marriage, you want to know what your spouse likes and what they don't like, right? And, and oftentimes, um, we've kind of come up with this phrase, uh, love languages, right? Knowing how our spouse um, likes to receive love, right? What really speaks to them. And I find it to be the case many times that when a couple um, first gets together, they just naturally think that their spouse's love language is the same as theirs. And oftentimes, it's not the case at all. That's certainly how it was for Nicole and I, um, when Nicole and I first started dating, my, my love language, uh, my top two love languages are uh, physical touch and uh, words of affirmation. And if you're a guy in the room, there's a good, like a 90% chance that those are your top two as well, um, because we're just kind of wired that way, right? But then Nicole's two love, top lang- love languages are not those. Hers are acts of service and quality time. Um, and so for the first few years of our marriage, I tried to show her love by doing the same sort of way that I received love, right? But at the same time, she was like, but that's not what I want, right? And as we, as we have grown in our marriage over time, I've, I've, I've learned that the way that she receives love is different than the way that I receive love, right? And so if, if, if I want to give her, if I want her to be able to receive that kind of love, I need to know what she likes. I need to know what she wants, Right? And so I, I know for Nicole, it's acts of service and quality time. And so this week, she got to go out of town. And it kind of checked both of those, right? It's act of service. I took care of the kids. And she got quality time alone, right? Checking both of those boxes off, right? And so, and so I think it's kind of the same way. In fact, it's been said oftentimes that God's love language is obedience. The way that we show God that we love him, not a requirement for our love, but the way that we show God that we love him is obedience to his words, right? And so as we come to this text, I want us to try to reframe our minds from just saying this kind of idea that we have of rules as kind of these strict do's and don'ts uh, of things that we can't do and can't do, can do and can't do, and more of how then through my obedience do I get to show God the love that I have for him, right? And that's why I prefer to say 10 words instead of the 10 commandments. There's nothing wrong with that, right? But I think we've just kind of contextualized that phrase 10 commandments to to mean one thing, um, where I think as we look at this in the context of a vow and of a marriage, um, that it was uh, maybe a little bit different. But as we continue to walk through the Bible, as we look through the first five books, which are known as the Torah or the Law of Moses, right? Um, We come up ultimately with 613 commands uh, that God gives. So if you read through the books of, uh, especially in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, as you read through those books, you will kind of get about 613 commands that all kind of flow from these 10 uh, words that we get at Sinai. And if we continue reading, we get to the New Testament and we get to the person of Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus responded, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he said this in verse 40, on these two commandments depends all of the law and the prophets. (laughs) 
I love Jesus' summation of the 10 and the 613, right? Because I love what Jesus did because he made it really simple. And I'm kind of a simple guy, and so it's really helpful that I only have two things to remember, right? First of all, he said that you should love God with everything that you have, right? That has to do with our vertical relationship with God. And so there's a, there's a group of commands and, and, and kind of uh, ways to obey God's word that has to do with our relationship with God. That's what we're going to look at today. But then he said there's another way that is to love our neighbor as ourself, which is to love people, which is all about our horizontal relationships with one another. We'll look at those next week. And so in one sense, whether we talk about the two commands of Jesus, the 10 words at Sinai, or the 613 laws that are in the Torah— The whole purpose of that is to understand God's way for people to live. And the purpose of that is for human flourishing, right? That we can live for everything that God wants us to be and everything God wants us uh, to experience in this life. And so the question that I I come to as I think about this, as I think about these 10 words, um, is the question, so why does this matter? Why does this matter? Especially as we think about this morning of these, ten, of, these, of these four words that relate to our relationship with God. Why does that matter? You see, our view or our understanding of God forms everything that we believe. I'm convinced that this is the greatest problem we face as a culture. I agree with the words of A.W. Tozer, who famously said, what we think about God is the most important thing about us. From our worth to our sexuality to our identity, to the way that we treat one another is all rooted in how we see God and how we understand who God is. If we see God as a non-existent kind of atheistic view of God who's not really there, then I become the standard for human flourishing. Whatever I want becomes the rules or the commands of how to live life. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, it's just me, and so I just get this life to live for what I want to. If we see God as some sort of distant or non-interested, what we would typically call an uh, agnostic view of God, again, I become the standard because I'm not really sure if God's there. And if he is, he doesn't really seem to be involved in humanity. But if, as the Bible presents, God is there, and he is a rescuer and a redeemer, and he cares about the way that I live and what I think about and how I treat others— then there's a whole new level of purpose and accountability and meaning to what I do. And so as we look at these four words today, there's two questions that we must answer. One, what do I learn about God from these 10 words, right? So there's going to come a point as we walk through each one of these that I'm going to ask the question, what do we learn about God? But I don't want to be the only one up here asking the question. So I'm going to point to you guys and you're going to say, what do we learn about God? We're going to practice, okay? This is really interactive. I know it's really complicated. I'm going to point to you and you're going to say, what do we learn about God? You guys ready? Great. You guys got it. All right. First time. All right. Great. So second thing we need to, to, to answer today, not only what do we learn about God, but do I trust the one who I'm making these vows to, right? As some of you have experienced in your life, or know people who have experienced in their life. There are people that will walk down an aisle and they will look at one another and make vows to one another and then not keep those vows. And if the root of making vows to one another comes this question of, do I trust the person that I'm making this vow to? And so we must understand, one, what, is, what do we learn about God from these commands? But then secondly, today, we must understand uh, or ask the question, do I ultimately trust the one that I'm making these vows to? <clears throat> so let's begin with number one. To put it in a simple way, the first vow that is, uh, the people of Israel asked to make is to love me alone. Verse three says, you shall have no other gods before me. Word number one and word number two, as we're going to see in a second, are closely related, right? In fact, many people have even seen them as one command. But we're going to separate them because I think there is a little bit of distinction in there. And this was definitely a direct response to Egypt and to God's conquering of those Egyptian gods. You guys know we've spent weeks and weeks and weeks talking about the deities of Egypt and how each one of them were in opposition to the one true God, right? 
And so this first part of the vow that God is asking his people to make is to, to identify that he alone is the one true God, the God that they will devote themselves to, right? That their allegiance will be given to them. We saw an example of this a few weeks ago um, when we were in the, in, the, in the passage between Moses and Jethro. And if you guys remember back in, verse, in chapter 18, verse 11, Jethro is, is, is recounting all of the things that he has heard that God has done for Israel. And his statement, his testimony is this. He says, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods because in this affair they dealt arrogantly with the people, right? He, he's making this statement that, you know what? Yahweh, the God of Israel, is above every other deity that's out there. Whether they be real or not, God is above every single one of them, this Yahweh. And as we walk, continue to walk through the story, the Egyptian gods would not be the only two gods or deities that they would have to come into contact with. In fact, when the Israelites get into the promised land, they'll become two prominent gods that they'll deal with. One of them that shows up many times in the Old Testament is a god named uh, Baal or Baal, depending on how you want to pronounce that. He was the Canaanite god of weather, right? And really the whole thing behind this, you remember as an agricultural community, right? Rain was kind of like, uh, was, was like the, the most important thing for them, right? It's whether or not their crops would come up. And so a lot of them would view Baal as this god of, 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 of profit or money, right? That if, that if it rained, then I had a lot of profit. And so I would, I would end up getting a lot of financial resources because of that. The other deity that they would come into contact with was known as Asherah. This was the Phoenician god of fertility. Later would become the Greek Aphrodite. And she was the goddess of illicit sexuality. And I think many times we, we think back to the story and we think, man, I can't believe that those ancient people had to deal with such a foreign concept of these other gods that were out there. Don't they realize that there's no other gods out there? And all I have to say is it's probably a good thing that we don't have to deal with the, with the idols of money and sex in our culture, right? No, I think we can understand that completely, right? We can understand that completely. And so God is asking his people, first off, will they commit to making him God alone? Will they love him exclusively? Okay, you guys ready for your part? Here we go. What do we learn about God? Man, I saw some excitement over here. I heard some excitement over on this side. I heard some inflection. I like it, right? We learn from this passage that God loves his people and wants to be loved by them alone, right? We learn that God wants the, uh, all of the love of his people. He doesn't want to share that with any of these other false deities that are out in the culture in the world. Number two, word number two, which, which is very closely related to number one, put me above all else. Verse four says this, you shall not make for yourselves a carven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of all those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Word two flows directly out of the first word that he gave, right? If there's to be no other gods than, Yah than Yahweh, then they shouldn't make any representations of these other false deities or these other things to be worshipped. I love Tim Keller's uh, definition of what an idol is. Tim Keller said it this way. He said, an idol is a good thing that becomes the ultimate thing in our life, right? And so while in our culture, we may not bow down to Baal or Asherah or these other deities that they had in Egypt or in, in, uh, as they entered into the promised land, right? Even though that may not be a part of our culture, there are things in our world that we make ultimate, that we put into God's place, Right? And so this idea of an idol is something that would, would take the place of God because God wants our love exclusively for him. The reformer John Calvin said it this way. He said, man's nature, so to speak, is a perpetual factory of idols. A perpetual factory of idols. Our heart continuing to churn out. As Tony Rourke says, the human heart is a, 
idol factory, turning out new idols like a conveyor belt in a manufacturing plant, rolling out new widgets. Viral idols gush out of fallen hearts and flood every nook and cranny of our media and of our culture in social media, television, music, movies, novels, and memoirs. You see, we are people who quickly make idols. Idol is something that takes God's place in our life, right? And so those, those can be really good things that we put, as, as Tim Keller said, into being ultimate things in our life. And, and I think that's something that's kind of a universal struggle for all of us, right? We all have those things that we want to put into God's place in our life. And so this is where we want to pause this morning and have a little bit of time for discussion because I think this is uh, important for us. So here's our questions this morning. Number one, what are the idols or gods of our culture? What are things that are worshipped or given that, that place in people's lives in our culture? How are these idols or gods worshipped? Like what's the way that we worship them? Um, and are there any issues with these things being worshipped as gods? If so, what are the issues? And how do we keep ourselves devoted to the one true God of this text? Uh, Nicole and I will be in the back with the kids doing kids discussion. Um, and we're going to talk about the same thing this morning. Um, what are those things that want to steal our hearts and our attention? So let's take the next five minutes. Let's talk about a few of these together. And then we're going to come back and we're going to um, kind of write some of these down on the board as we walk through uh, the rest of our passage. All right, you guys, we're going to go ahead and bring it back together. Um, thank you guys for that time. I know um, we wanted to spend a little bit more time on that this morning just because um, we, we really do feel like that is, that is a, a really, that is a p big struggle for many of us, right, is to devote our time to God, um, to give Him the proper place in our hearts and our minds um, that we give to other things um, as well. And so um, I just want to kind of uh, see what you guys came up with in y'all's groups. What are some of the things that you guys identified in those groups um, that are idols or gods in our, in our world, in our culture, in our lives. What'd you guys, what'd y'all come up with? Food? Okay. What else? People. Money. School. Sports. Time. Other people. Yep, we got people. That's good. What else? Ourself. There's an E in there. Knowledge. Family. Okay, cool. That's good. That's good. So as we, you know, and here's the thing, like, as we look at these things, like, those are not bad things in and of themselves, right? There's nothing on this list that's, like, inherently bad in and of itself, right? Which I think is, is, is why it's so important that we understand uh, what an idol is and how it plays that role in our life, right? As, as Keller said, like, it's when, it's when a good thing, right, becomes the ultimate thing in our life. So any of these things are good in and of themselves, right? We, we need food, but when that becomes the, the litmus test for my happiness or, or money in the same way or people, or relationships, right? Those are all good things, but when they take the place of God in our life, right? That's when they get out of, out of sync. As, as Calvin said, we are idol-making factories, right? It's just our natural go-to is to take these things and to turn them into ultimate things, all right? Here's kind of a litmus test, though, that I find oftentimes is helpful for me. Um, if whatever that thing is, if it's temporarily taken out of my life, and then I just completely lose my mind in that moment, it's probably something that's an idol in my life, right? So it's like if, if you know, maybe for example, um, I really like have a hobby that I'm really enjoying and then something interrupts that hobby, right? And I just absolutely like can't stop thinking about it. It's probably a good thing that it's probably a chance that that thing is, is out of its proper order or place in my life, right? Um, and I would ask the same thing, like how many of us, if we miss our Sunday fellowship together, if we miss our devotion in the morning, if we miss our prayer time, right? How many times are we hardly even bothered by that fact sometimes, right? 
And again, it's, it's not a list of do's and don'ts in relationship to, to God in the sense that our relationship with God is dependent on doing these things, but it is an indication of where our hearts are as we relate to God. And so, now we come to uh, the question that we need to ask this morning about this second word, which is, you guys are getting better at this. Uh, what do we learn about God, right? Well, it says in the second part of that verse is that God is jealous for his people, for the hearts of his people, and that he will not share that glory with anything else, right? And so we must ask the question, why would God even care? <coughs> And it's much like the picture, again, of marriage, of a husband, and how a husband would feel if another man approaches his wife or his children and offers them to be the ultimate thing in their life, right? It's the same way. God loves his people, and he wants their hearts. He wants their attention. And what's interesting here is that God discloses a little bit of his character in this moment. He self-discloses that he is a jealous God, That he's jealous for his people's attention. And on first reading, that might seem unfair. Or it might be like, well, how it's it's bad when I'm jealous, right? How can God be jealous, right? That's a question a lot of people ask. Well, see, the difference is, is that God is creator. And as creator, he is the only one who deserves our worship. He's the only one who deserves that place in our lives, right? So for humans, if we're jealous of something, oftentimes it's because we have things out of their proper order, right? And so I'm jealous because I don't have what somebody else has, but I don't necessarily inherently deserve that, right? God, being the creator, deserves to have our hearts and our attention, and so he is rightly jealous when we give our hearts and our attention to someone else. And I also love uh, the second part of that uh, verse that says that God shows his steadfast love. His, the NIV translates that as his covenant loyalty to thousands of people, right? To thousands of people. God loves his people so much, and his heart breaks for us when we chase after these things that will never ultimately satisfy our hearts and not lead to human flourishing. So that was word number two. Word number three, we're going to move a little bit quickly as we, as we move through the next, uh, the next two. Uh, word number three is, speak well of me. It says this in verse seven, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You see, relationships are based on trust, right? And so taking God's name, which we've seen is strongly associated with his character and who he is, his essence, if we take that in vain, if we, if we somehow lower God's value by using his name as something common, right? Or if, uh, we, we, if we do the, the thing of like using God's name as a guarantor uh, into something that we're doing, we're somehow making God less than who he really is. In fact, in the Jewish culture, they had this uh, really uh, interesting practice. Many Jews refrained from using the personal name Yahweh of God. Instead, they would just use the phrase Hashem, which means the name, because they didn't want to break this command. They wanted God's name to be so holy and so set apart that they didn't want to make it a common thing in their vernacular. And so they actually picked a different word to refer to God, right? And so we must understand that God's name must be respected, because ultimately, it's, it's not just his name, but it's his character and his person, right? When we lower God down to something common, and we use his name just as a, a common way, right? Whether that's using his name in a, in a curse word, whether that's slandering with his name, whether that's somehow misrepresenting his character, all of those things are taking God and making him less than who he really is. And it's interesting, too, that in the end of verse 7, it says that those persons will not be held guiltless. It doesn't tell us what the consequences for that is, but it does tell us that they will not be held guiltless. And so again, we come to our question that we've been asking all morning. What do we learn about God? Donnie, I love it. <laughs> we learn that God and his name specifically represents him and must be used properly. Number four, as we get to our fourth word here, is that God wants us to spend time with him, right? Number uh, verse eight says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. 
Six days you shall labor and do all the work, but on the seventh day is, is, uh, is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your sons or your daughters or your male servants or your female servants or your livestock or the sojourners who are within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. The Sabbath may seem misplaced here in the list of commandments relating to God, but it's actually the linchpin because it's all about spending time with God. You see, the way that we show God that we love him is through obedience and quality time with him, right? Spending time with him. Douglas Stewart said it this way. He says, the Sabbath functions as such as a sign for the Mosaic or Sinai covenant. It provides a regular weekly reminder for everyone as they keep the Sabbath to stop working and devote themselves to worship. They demonstrate openly that they are keeping the covenant. It's much like what we do with a uh, anniversary, right? So if you're married, when your anniversary comes along, right, usually you do something special on that day to remind you of the covenant promise you made when you stood before God and before man to make that covenant to your spouse, right? In the same way, the Sabbath operated this way for the Israelites. It was a once-a-week once a reminder for the people of the covenant and the, and the relationship that they had with their God, and in so doing, we know that quality time is a quotient for good relationships, right? Any kind of relationships, whether that's a friendship, whether that's a marriage, right? Any type of relationship you're in, quality time is going to make that relationship better. In fact, the more time that you spend with the person and the better the quality of the time, the better the quality and the depth of the relationship that you're in. And so Sabbath is not about just limiting one day to taking a rest, and it's not just about one day to remember the Lord. It's about both. It's about resting and remembering who God is. So now a lot of times Christians has the question, have the question, do we still have to keep a Sabbath? Is it a requirement for a Christian to keep a Sabbath? And I, would, I can say this morning that the answer is no and yes at the same time. No, in the sense that it's not a basis for our covenant or our relationship with God. We are now under a covenant of grace. We are not bonded to the law. But at the same time as a requirement for relationship with God, we should be setting time aside to spend with God. Yes, in the sense that the Sabbath did not begin here in the book of Exodus. It actually began in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, as God is creating everything in the fabric of creation, God said that you should set aside a day to spend with him. That a part of the rhythm of life that leads to human flourishing is to actually spend a day to set aside to spend time with God. Now, we're not required as to what day that has to be or exactly what that has to look like. But there's two components that are really, really important. And we see this laid out both in Genesis and in Exodus. One is that it's a, it's a day to rest. It's a day to rest. As we rest from our work, it's a day for us to emulate what God did in creation, right? Some of us, the most spiritual thing that we can do is have one day a week that we get a nap in, right? Because some of us, like we need a nap or we get grumpy, right? Speaking from someone who's like that, right? Nicole can tell you, if I don't get a nap at some point, I'm a grumpy dude, right? So we need a day to rest our bodies, because God rested, not because he had to, because he wanted to, to weave that into the fabric. But, it, but, but also, just as important as resting, is the day to remember God, right? It's a day to make it holy because it has a special purpose to think about God. So it's not just about a day about relaxing, but at the same time as we are resting from our work, we're also remembering all that God has done for us. It's a day of gratitude and thankfulness, Right? And, and, and you guys remember this too. The Sabbath was given to humanity as a gift in Genesis 2. It's a gift, right? And here's the thing about a gift. You can choose not to take it, right? But if you choose not to take it, you're going to miss out on what it is, right, that God has for you. And so I would encourage you guys to take that time once a week to set apart and to, and to be with God and to rest from your work. You guys ready? Last one. You guys really got this down. What do we learn about God? We learn that God wants to be with his people. 
And before we skip over that phrase too quickly, let me just say it one more time. We learn that God wants to be with his people. Think about this. Many people in our world hold to a view of the world called agnosticism. And agnosticism just kind of is this idea that, you know what, there's, there's probably some sort of higher power out there, but I don't really know who that is, and I don't really, he doesn't really have a whole lot of interaction with me. You see, the Sabbath, this, this fourth word that Moses gives to the people from God, actually flies right in the face of that. Because he is reminding his people that we have a God who actually wants to be with his people. Have you guys thought about how incredible that is? That the same God that created everything that we know in the world, the same God that would send his son to come and to die for our sins, actually wants to spend time with us? Right? I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine that that same God wants to actually spend time with us? It's amazing. I kind of get that same feeling sometimes when I think about my wife. I'm like, man, she actually wants to hang out with me? Like she sees all the flaws and all the, the like messed up things about me in my life, and yet she still wants to spend time with me? Like, that's pretty amazing. And to the trillionth degree, that's what God, the God of the universe, says about his people, that he wants to be with us. In fact, Scripture will go on in the New Testament to say that God wanted to be with us so much that he came and he wrapped on flesh. In John chapter 1, it says that that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt literally means to tabernacle. God brought his presence to be among us because he wants to be with his people. God so wants a relationship with his people that he wants to be with us. He wants to spend time with us. And so we've answered the question from these first four words, what do we learn about God, right? He's a God who wants to be first. He's a God that wants us to be faithful. He's a God that wants us to speak well of him, and he's a God that wants to spend time with us. The question we must answer ourselves or ask ourselves now is, do we trust him? Do we trust him, right? Because the basis for any covenant relationship has to be trust. And when we come to these commands, I think for many of us, oftentimes we ask the question, well, what role do these vows play in my relationship with God today? I'm not an ancient Israelite. Do they still have relevance for my life today? And let me just say, as an ancient Israelite, following these 613 commands or these 10 commandments, right, were the requirements for relationship for God in the Old Testament. Because the substitute lamb had not come yet. And so following these commandments were the basis for relationship to prove faithfulness to God's covenant. But for New Testament believers, it is no longer a requirement for relationship, but a responsibility that we get to keep this relationship. You see, Scripture tells us that Jesus has already fulfilled all of these requirements for us. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 15, verse 17 through 18, Jesus himself says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I've come uh, come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus kept each one of these commandments and these laws perfectly as our substitute. And so now as we come into our relationship with God, And we see these commandments that God has for us in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's not that I keep them as a basis for my relationship, but as a responsibility that I have. It's much like this. I know I've used uh, the the picture of marriage a lot, but I think it's just what we see in this passage. I remember when I was a single guy, right? I had far less responsibilities, right? In fact, when I was a single guy, I just could kind of do what I wanted to do right? I could take my Saturdays, I could take my days off and just kind of do whatever I wanted to do. If I wanted to go out to eat, I could go out to eat. If I wanted to, you know, go hang out with a friend, I could go hang out with a friend. But when I got married, I got these new responsibilities. But here's the thing. There is no way that I would trade in that for what God has given me in that relationship, right? And I see now not my responsibilities as a burden, but as something that is a part of this covenant relationship that I've made. 
In the same way, God wants us to see that his commandments are not to be a burden for his people, but a responsibility that we gladly take on in obedience to him. In fact, uh, John uh, the, uh, in the uh, in John chapter First uh, John chapter five says this. He says, "For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. His commandments are not burdensome, right?" And so you ask the question, "Do we have to follow the Ten Commandments?" And the answer emphatically is yes. Not as a requirement, but as a responsibility in the relationship that we have with God. And so I want to kind of just jump to the end this morning, okay? I want to ask this last question, because I think it kind, of, it kind of answers everything we've talked about this morning. As we think about God, the question we must ask is, is he a priority? Do we put God first before anything or anyone in our life? Are there any false idols in our life that we put before God? Do we respect God's name so much that we will represent him accurately as we go out into the world? And finally, will we spend time with him, lots of time with him, not as a requirement, but because we're so in love with him that we want to spend time with him? And so that's the question, right? That's the, that's the, that's the application for us this morning. As we think about these first four words that relate to our relationship with God, Will we prioritize him above everything else in our life? Let me just take you back to Jesus' response in Matthew chapter 22, verse 35 through 38. I want you just to listen to these words as we close. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the great commandment? What is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the great and first commandment. Jesus summed up those 10, first of all, by saying, we must love God. So the question this morning is, do you love him? And do we show him the love that we have for him by obedience and by spending time with him? So I want to pray for us this morning. Um, Chris is going to come up and lead us in one last song uh, before we close out this morning. And, and maybe, maybe, you know, maybe sometimes we get our priorities kind of out of whack sometimes. Um, I've done that many times. You can come on up, Chris. Uh, many times we get our priorities out of whack. So maybe this morning as we sing this last song, maybe it's just a moment for you just in the quiet of your heart this, this, in this moment just to, just to tell God that you're sorry for kind of getting those out of out of whack and, and that you want to reprioritize your relationship with him this week. So let me pray for us and then we're going to sing together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, your words to us and that God, that you reveal so much of who you are uh, through your word. And so I pray this morning as we uh, have looked at these words that you gave to your people, I pray that, that these would be words that would not just be laws and rules as such, God, but these would be truth, that these would be, uh, this, this would be a way of living that would lead to the ultimate relationship with you. So I pray for our church family this week as we endeavor to live this out, as we endeavor to put you first, God, with everything that we have, with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind, everything that we have, God, that we would put you first in our lives. Because, God, you are ultimate, and you deserve it. So we thank you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I invite you guys to stand with us as we sing this last song together.